It gives me great pleasure to introduce Joseph O'Connor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for that lovely introduction. Maybe we'll fix this a bit. Thank you. I don't speak French quite as beautifully, though, I must say. It was great to hear you saying pre Madeleine Zepter the way you did. Was, you're a man of many talents, Paul. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here again after, we think, eight years, seven or eight years. And I've given a lot of readings all over the world, many parts of the United States, but I have a particular treasured memory of that afternoon here at Prairie Lights. And, you know, no matter where you go in the world, if you're among people who love books and you mention the name of this city, um, within 10 seconds, somebody will mention the name of Paul Ingram. And I think he's just been such an ambassador for the place. And for all of us who love books, he's just done so much uh, over such a long time. We've kept in touch now and again over all of those years and exchanged family stories. And he's a man of such warmth and hospitality and knowledge. And he shares his knowledge with such gentleness. And to me, Paul and this shop and the people of this city who love books as they do um, are a reminder of why we have fiction, why we love this wonderful thing called the novel that brings people together from so many different cultures and so many different societies to celebrate this beautiful world of storytelling. So, it's St. Valentine's Night, let's have a love story, and I will just contextualise it for you briefly. Yesterday morning, when I woke up in Dublin, it feels like about five days ago, but it actually was <laughs> just yesterday morning, um, when I was driving to the airport to come here, I passed the coast of South County Dublin, where I grew up, and where this great Irish writer, John Millington Singh, a man who wrote a famous play that some of you will have heard of or seen, called The Playboy of the Western World. He lived there about a hundred years ago, and he was um, a somewhat reticent, buttoned up, um, damaged man. He had been hurt in love a few times as a young man, um, as most of us were, I suppose, a few times when we were young. But there was something in his childhood that never gave him the ability to recover from this. He'd had a very, very strict biblical um, upbringing. He never knew his father who died when he was a baby. And Singh was a genius. He was involved, as I say, a hundred years ago in really resurrecting Ireland from the damage that had been caused by the famine and the years of mass emigration and the disappearance of this culture, one of the oldest cultures in Europe, um, the almost disappearance of its language, um, of its stories, of its songs, sing along with the great Yeats and Lady Gregory and a small number of Protestant intellectuals based in Dublin embarked on the project of trying to save as much of this culture as they could. And one way in which they did it was through the founding of the Abbey Theatre, the world's first national theatre, came into existence before the nation of Ireland itself did. Um, and that was where Singh worked. So he's 38 as the story opens. And in real life, in the last few years of his life, Singh, who, as I say, was this rather reticent man, um, met and fell in love with a, a younger woman from the inner city of Dublin, a woman called Molly Allgood, who was an apprentice actress at the Abbey Theatre. She was 18 when they met. She was a Catholic, where Singh was a Protestant. She was born in the tenements of Dublin, where my own grandparents were born. It was a very uh, fiery, garrulous, flirtatious, um, sparky young woman very different to sing. So on paper, these two people have nothing in common. And yet they met and they fell in love um, because 
love overcomes difficulties and the song of love is the song of heart's desire. And in real life, while we don't know much about the relationship, um, precisely because of all of the differences of class and background and religion which the relationship transgressed, it was conducted very much in secret. We only have one half of the correspondence. Molly's letters to sing were all destroyed in the years after his death. Um, so we don't know much about them. The couple of things we do know, they had little uh, sort of endearments, pet terms for each other, as lovers sometimes do. She used to call him Tramp. Um, it was kind of an irony, given that he was a very prosperous man. But his plays are full of tramps and the landless people of Ireland. And he used to call her Changeling, which is a figure from Irish folklore. If one of your parents was a, a, a supernatural, a, a fairy, and if one of the, your other your other parent was a, a mortal person, you were a changeling. You had the ability to change your shape. So they that's what they called each other, and we don't know a whole lot more. So I'm going to read you three extracts, totaling I suppose about twenty minutes. I'm going to read first from the opening of the novel, which is in London, in the 1950s, and has Molly looking back. Um, on how they met. And then I'm going to read a piece from chapter three, which is uh, describes their courtship. I wonder, could we have another go at fixing this microphone? Let's see now. It's just to stop it sort of. No, no. I, 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 <laughs> Paul, I, I know you have a great respect for me, but I, I, you, you're not required to kneel at my feet. Okay, no, it's fine, I'll hold it. And, th and then I'm going to read from the end. So the end is back to the beginning. You know, the end is from a letter that she wrote as a, as a young woman. And um, so this is fiction, as I say, very loosely based on fact, but uh, basically a work of fiction. So here we go. This is from Ghostlight, Chapter 1. A lodging house room in London... 27th of October, 1952, 6.43 a.m. In the top floor room of the dilapidated townhouse across the terrace, a light has been on all night. From your bed, it was visible whenever you turned towards the window, which you had to do in order to fetch your bottle from the floor. Most nights the same, the bulb is lighted at dusk. In the mornings, a couple of moments after the street lamps flicker out, it dies and the ragged curtain is closed. You are 65 now, perhaps the age of that house, perhaps even a little older. What a thought. You approach your only window. It is shockingly cold to the touch. Winter is coming to England. The weather has been bitter. Last night, a hurricane struck London. You have never noticed anyone enter or exit that forlorn house. But the postman still delivers to it, stuffing envelopes through the broken glass in the door panel. The letterbox has been nailed closed many years. Men urinate in the porch. One of the street girls plies her trade there. And the balustrade has long been splashed with obscene words. Many of the window embrasures are boarded. Budlia sprouts from the façade. You have a sense that the occupant of the room is a man. One midnight, a fleeting shadow crossed the upper window pane, so you thought, and there was maleness in how it moved. There was a time when you used to think about him. How can he live alone in a bomb-blasted old house? Who sends the letters? What are they about? For it helped to pass the brutal hours immediately preceding dawn. But this morning, someone else is come to you again, out of the same light somehow, out of an unseen room, out of a city you have lived in the last thirteen years, but have never found a reason to call your own. This has happened to all of us, a coasting across the mind by one we had thought forgotten or purposefully banished. But today will prove him a wanderer, reluctant to be exiled, an emigrant still attempting to come home. He could be difficult sometimes. What use in denying it? Irritable, 
unforgiving for a relatively young man. Because the whisperers and gossips and sniggerers always made such a point of the age difference between you. Envious vixens, triple-chinned hypocrites, too deceitful to utter their true objection. For what are years, fictions, ink stains on a calendar? There are moments of late when yesterday feels a life ago, and tomorrow an unborn century, so unreachable it seems. And had he lived beyond his youth, the years would have contracted, because a married couple become the same age, grow to resemble one another over time, like bookends, their recollections in grayed bindings between them, and neither bothering to read what once divided them. What's this he'd be now? Eighty, something, a slippered old duffer, a shuffler, an old bags. Hard to work the calculation through the fog of a hangover. Your reckoning of the decades keeps stalling, tripping up. After a few ruined attempts, you abandon it. You take a small, sour sip, medicinal, just a settler. The reek of gin dampens your eyes, somehow intensifies his presence, but you grimace it away with a swallow. The daily spite of this unmannerly town. Wasn't it Yeats wrote that? Or my other lunk, Shaw? Dublin, he was whining about, but all towns are unmannerly, to the old, the poor, the collaborator. What is it in poets that must dress a thing up? Christ, they'd nearly call their dandruff the fairy snow. Not long after dawn, the shadow kissing time, Grey light at the window and the whistle of the kettle as you move about, failing to keep warm. Mittens flittered to ribbons. You wear a dead man's boots, while no point in wastefulness, a sin. Down below, in Brickfield's terrace, a milk wagon is delivering. You wonder would the man advance you another month's credit, but the fear of being declined dissuades you. Frost silvers the pavement, the telephone kiosk, the street, the wrecked colonnades of the house where the light burns all night, an awning over the grocers on the corner of Porchester Road. Rooks are circling the chimney breasts. You shuffle away from the window to the cubby hole by the cooking ring. The room smells of cabbage and dust. Somewhere below you, a wireless is playing too loudly, but you do not object to the interruption, find it oddly cheering sometimes. There are hours late at night when you miss its consolation. Silence can be frightening to the lonely. He always said you were over-imaginative, too given to fantasy. A Catholic trait, he would joke. These nights you read Mills and Boons from the Tuppany Library in Earl's Court Road. Sure you'd be lost for a bit of an escape, only it wasn't for true romances. How he'd have hated them, your dog-eared and tear-stained bedfellows. Opium for spinsters, he'd mock. The sun would dry the oceans wide. Heaven would cease to be. The world would cease its motion, my love ere I'd prove false to thee. A song on the radio that would draw the heart out of you, Molly, that anyone ever felt such devotion. Chapter 3 Kingstown, a prosperous suburb of Dublin, 1908 There is a part of the garden by the cluster of sycamores, near the bend in the drive where the gravel is wearing thin. And if he stands there quietly on a still Sunday morning, when none of the servants is around to annoy him, and when mother is up in her room at her scriptures, he can hear the distant approach of the train from Dublin, the wind-borne shush and chug that means she might be coming to him again. He is thirty-six now, already very ill, Painful years have passed since he stopped believing he could be loved. The power of what is happening terrifies him. He leaves his mother's garden, makes hurriedly for Glenageary Station, up the willow-lined avenue towards St. Paul's Church of Ireland. 
past the entrance to the quarry lanes, known locally as the Metals, through which the granites were hefted long ago for the stanchions of Kingstown Pier. There are days when he feels hammered, his breathing sometimes knifes him, but punctuality is important, a sign of respect, he says. The walk from his mother's house takes about seven minutes. Often he arrives as the locomotive is chuntering to its screechy standstill and belching grimy spumes of cinders and mizzle. He skulks in the station portico, not daring to hope, lowering his eyes quickly if a neighbour happens past. It would not do to be seen, not yet, not here. There is the age difference between them, but that is not all. There are the differences that cannot be noticed in an instant. And then, where can she be? She materialises through the smoke. There she is, beckoning circumspectly from a second-class window. It is like a small moment out of Tolstoy, perhaps. One of those seemingly simple but reverberating images he values in the novels of Russia. He pictures her stepping down through the vapour, the soot, then hurrying along the platform to him, parasol in hand. She comes to him through the filth, her face hopeful and kind, the steam moistening a strand of hair to her forehead. But this cannot happen, people might see. There would be talk around Glenageary. Instead, he boards the train, takes the bench opposite her in the carriage. They're like a couple of collaborators plotting an act of treason. Outside, the conductor is slamming the doors, a whistle is blown, a green flag is flourished. As the engine gives a shriek and they judder away from Glenageary, he begins to feel something like relief. From the pocket of her raincoat is protruding a play script, he notices. She uses the journey from the city to learn her lines. And nobody could say she is beautiful exactly, but she is an actress. She is able to decide whether to be beautiful or plain. Like a changeling, he tells her, his preferred endearment. Like many sweet nothings, an ambiguity. The train clatters into the tunnel at Kilini. He is alone with her in darkness. He feels her hand steal into his. This thrills him, charges him. No one can see. The moment passes quickly. There is a dazzle of light and the panorama of the bay is magnificent, Italian. Along the cliff top at Shangana, a cormorant hangs in the air. It will not be too long before they come coasting into Bray, where nobody knows him. Bray is safe. Passers-by might think them a father and daughter as they exit Bray Station and she links him at the elbow and they go walking down the promenade in the direction of the head through a swirl of dirty gulls and old newspapers. He looks older than his years. She looks younger than hers. He has achieved some recognition in the field of play writing. Translations of two of his works have been performed in Prague and Berlin. He is co-director of the Irish National Theatre Society. But few in this frumpy little town would know he was a writer, and fewer if they knew would care. His companion has appeared in three of his plays, bit parts at first, but she was soon elevated to leads. Past cold grey wavelets breaking on the stones, past the suck in the runnels of Strand. This is from the epilogue. Old letter found among her papers, unmailed. Duane's Inn and Grocery, near Carraro, Cashla Bay, Connemara, Galway, 24th of July, 1907. Dearest Tramp, I am after writing out your name and looking at the page a hundred years. I am unsure I should go on at all, or if you'd like a line or two from your bad old penny. So how are you keeping this weather and you without me up in Dublin? Are you fading away like the morning dew? 
I hope you won't be thick with me now for writing, and you buried in your old play like a miner. Tis midnight in Connemara, and I can't find the morphine. Downstairs, they're at the drinking and the singing of sad songs. They live only for pleasure, the stony grey islanders, and the dark deep sup of the blackness. It's said there's a storm coming, no one seems to care. An hour ago, a girl was singing the lass of Rock Royale, and everything went still, oh, as still as the air. And you came drifting in and sat down by my window. I was thinking about that night in Cork when that old drunkard was singing it near the market. Do you remember his hands? They were like gnarled bits of bog oak. We were going somewhere or coming home. Was it after the theatre, maybe? And there was a fella too old to be begging, and he collecting money in a cap, and a dog on a rope with a scarf around his neck, and yourself, big owl soft heart, were crying. The sun would dry the oceans wide. Heaven should cease to be. The world would lose its motion, my love, ere I'd prove false to thee. I was thinking about when we quarrelled, you silly, jealous lunk. I hate it when we quarrel. It makes me afraid you want to leave me. Sure, I'd no more go with another fella. You are too silly a goose for words. I might play a little game of winks and bat my eyes, but that is all. And I'll quit it if you really do wish me to. The thought that I'd make you unhappy, you blethering old baboon when it's myself is at your mercy and always will be. And I hate it when you say I'd be better off with some easy-going chap. God, it makes me want to scream the face off you, so it does. Some harmless nice fella and his collars in a drawer and his mammy sewing him up for the winter. What would I do with him when it's my crabby old scrivener I only want? You do say it for the divilment of maddening me, don't you? Didn't I know it the moment I saw you, before you'd ever given me the time of day? Long before you ever touched me, or even I heard your name spoken. Girls, nonsense, I hear you saying. Never happens in life, only in storybooks and songs. And the queerest thing of all is, I agree with my tramper. I haven't hide nor hair of reasons for what's between us now. And if ever you wanted to quit your impatient girl truly, and our little story had to be put away in a room that's only sometimes remembered, well, that's still a room I'd want, and I'd go there now and again, like some room in an old hotel on a seafront someplace where two sinners did something they shouldn't. Do you mind what I am telling you? It is the God's honest truth. Even if I never saw you or heard from you again, you'd already have been the miracle of my life. Oh, I can see you rolling your 700-year-old eyes and saying I make it all sound like a novel for dressmakers, you bitter-mouthed old granny. But to find you in my mind at some moment of the morning, to see some sentence in a script... I wonder what my tramper would say to it. Or to feel you glowing on like a lamp in my head and to know I'd sleep in your arms that night. There's nothing in the world would ever give me the joy of that. Nothing in the great round world. You're forever at me to talk. Only I'm sometimes afraid. The things I should have told you when we were walking Kalini Strand like that knowing you is the greatest blessing of anything in my life. And I can't think up the phrases and the fiery words you have yourself, for there's not languages enough in all the living world to tell you of your preciousness to me. And everything about you gives me courage I never, ever had. And without you, I'm like a ghost drifting through some old house of a life, And there's nothing about you I don't love. You are so kindly and good 
and wise, and I love you, and so patient, and so loyal, and so manly. So now you know all. Can I send you this letter? Are you reading it still? Am I mad? When we marry, can we go to America and stay there a time? That's if you still want me, my ploughboy. Oh, wouldn't we be the nice pair of ornaments in New York or Brooklyn or some place? To flit away from this rainy sad land and the gossips and the dullards and the pokers of noses and old maids. There's times I think it'll choke us. If only we could go. We would live to 150 in America. Do you think I could ever play a lead in New York or Chicago? Ah, my tramper, wouldn't that be something entirely? We'd be two fools with the laughter, and we traipsing down the Broadway and back to some little flat in the midnight. It makes me weep with heart's joy when I think I have found you, and all the lover's adventures we will share. Do you know the way I have sometimes wept when we've been together alone? For all the pleasures you have given me have left me nothing else to do. That is how I feel this night. How I wish I had you here. I would measure your neck with my kisses. God, I can't sleep tonight. What is ailing your girl? Do you remember you asked me one time to sing you a song and I was nervous for I hadn't had lessons? It was the first day we ever spoke to one another in Sackville Street, by the post office. But if you were here, I'd sing it now. Would you like that, old tramper? Because the words on a page are only words on a page. But a song needs someone to love it by hearing. It was yourself told me that once. It was that night we were in Cork. An old drunkard was singing it, and not a soul of the world listening. But you and me were. And it's in my head now. And as long as I live, and no matter what happens us, I'll hear it every time I hear the rain. The sun would dry the oceans wide. Heaven should cease to be. The world will cease its motion, my love, ere I had prove false to thee. Well, it's coming on for dawn. I better go to sleep. Do you think I should send this when you don't want interrupting? You're right. I shouldn't, but tomorrow I'm going to, as soon as the storm is over. Wished, I think it's lulling. Wait now till I listen. Everything is quiet, only the waves on the stones. It's little enough Irish I'll be learning today, I'm thinking. I can hear the terns calling. Beautiful sound. Come with me up to the cliffs and we'll watch them an hour. We won't say a word, let the sea be all our talk. Just the gulls and the fishermen's boats heading out and the trawl nets unrolling behind them. I kiss this paper, dear man. Touch it to your lips. I'm half afraid to send it. I don't know why. The sun is coming up. You're changeling. There we are. Thank you. Thank you. So, a love story for Valentine's Night. There we are. All the best love stories are sad ones. So, I'm happy to um, answer questions or listen to jokes or oh, anything. Uh, I need to take this out to whoever asks questions so that it gets properly broadcast. Have we a question right away? Nobody ever wants to ask them. No, I'll ans- ask the first question. Oh, I, you've saved, saved me the, first, the right of first questioning. <laughs> Do you ever feel uh, too much loyalty to history when you're writing um, historical fiction? Does it get in the way of the story to know too much about history? Um, well, yes, is the answer. I mean, I think what a what a novel does is a completely different thing from from what the the textbook or the or the work of history 
does. And you have to be very, very careful because um, I think the more researched a novel is, the more it sort of turns to ashes to the reader. And we've all read a particular sort of historical novel where, you know, you're just getting nicely caught up with the characters and everything is fine and you're really on board with them and you understand them. And suddenly it's as though everything stops and there's a kind of PowerPoint presentation on what kind of <laughs> what kind of shoes people wore in 1907. Or there's often a lot about the terribly painful and inadequate um, dental um, practices of the time or awful things to do with medicine, operations without anaesthetic. And you know what's happened is that the author has discovered a really fascinating article about this in, in the National Library and just cannot bear to leave it out, you know. So we sit around, we have the PowerPoint presentation, and then when that's over, we try and get the novel going again. So you really have to watch that because, of course, what readers want is to be in the world of the book. It has to be emotionally true. And it has to be emotionally recognisable to us now, rather than a museum-like recreation of the past. You know, so you have to tread that quite carefully. I mean, that said, any novel, whether it's set now or in the past, readers, if it engages with the real world, with the actual world at all, readers like you to get it right. You know, they're very, very unforgiving um, if, if you get it wrong. I had a novel published a few years ago, <coughs> called Inish Owen, which is an Irish place name. And um, it's set in a particular part of Ireland, County Donegal, if anybody has been there. And I, I had about halfway through two characters walk down the street in Inish Owen. And I said that they turned left and they passed the church and then they turned right and it was past Murphy's Bar. And um, I got a letter from a woman who lives in Inish Owen saying, you know, dear Mr. O'Connor, I loved your book. It was going great for me. And then I got to page 202. And I mean, everybody knows, everyone surely knows in the whole world that if you walk down that street and turn left, it's the Protestant church, not the Catholic church. And it's O'Connor's bar. It's not Murphy's bar. And it ruined the novel for me. I couldn't believe a single thing after that. So you have to be careful with that. And then when you're writing historical fiction, of course, there's a whole set of things you have to be careful about to do with the past, that you can't have um, characters know things that weren't known at the time. You have to be careful of anachronisms in language, people using words that hadn't been invented yet. Um, and in the privacy of this room, I will confess that um, in my book Star of the Sea, which I read from the last time I was here, a few of these slipped in to the to the book. Um, it's set in 1847 on a famine ship journeying from Ireland. And in the opening scene, the prologue, which is very kind of operatic and symphonic, it's very, very sad and poignant. And the central character, Pius Mulvey, is leaving Ireland for the last time. Everybody's dying. Everybody's heartbroken. And it's late at night on the ship. He's looking up at the stars on a beautiful wintry night, a clear night like tonight, the silver stars. And he knows he'll never see Ireland, his homeland again. And he's just leaving. The last few coastal islands are drifting past. And I thought just to sophisticate the scene slightly, that I, I would give him one really warm memory to take with him. And I decided that when this man, Pius Mulvey, was a boy... He was at school in Ireland and the schoolmaster gave the children a little mnemonic, a little memory device to remember the sequence of the planets from the sun. And he's standing on the ship now, he's looking up at the stars and it comes back to him. And the device is, <coughs> Mary's violet eyes make John sit up nights praying. And the initial letter of each of those words is one of the planets. So lovely scene, the book comes out. And a man writes to me from the, the British, you know, astro Astronomical Society to say, we, we, we have a bit of a problem here. Um, because, you know, um, he said, first of all, Mary's violet eyes make John sit up nights praying. Praying is for Pluto. Um, Pluto was discovered in the 1920s, I think. 1930. And we're still not totally sure about Pluto. Isn't that right? We, we know there's something out there. We're not sure if it's Pluto. So he can't have known about it in 1847. So the book became successful, thankfully, despite all its errors. So it was reprinted. So I took it out and I had Mary's Violet Eyes make John sit up nights. 
And then the same wretch wrote to me again. He could have told me the first time. He said, we still have a problem because sit up nights, nights is N for Neptune. Neptune was discovered in 1847, the, the year that your novel is set. So you're telling me that this poor, starving, illiterate man, you know, on the deck of the ship, this Connemara peasant, he's been reading the scientific journals, you know, he's very up to date. So, so, I, so the book was reprinted, I took it out again. So it's like with every reprint of the book, the solar system is getting smaller all the time. So, so you need to be careful about that kind of thing. I remember another one now, actually. It's, uh, it is worth reading, I have to say, despite all these terrible mistakes. There's another scene in, in Connemara, in the west of Ireland, in 1847. Everybody's hungry and sad and lonely. And I have a wolf howling in the distance, which I thought was just a standard issue, you know, atmospheric sound. So, so, uh, so a guy writes to me from, you know, the Irish Wolf Appreciation <laughs> Society to say that that couldn't have happened because, again, as everybody knows, um, the last wolf in Ireland was shot, you know, in 1792. And, and, and here's, you know, an etching of the wolf. And here's the portrait of the man who shot him. And here's how much he weighed. And I did what I never usually do at the instigation of my lovely father, Sean. I wrote back to that man and I said, well, that can't have been the last wolf in Ireland. That was the second last wolf in Ireland because the last wolf in Ireland is in Connemara in 1847 in my novel. <laughs> So, but, so, you, you, so you, need, you need to be careful about all of that. And I, then I suppose more seriously, um, th I've written three historical novels now in a row, and I suppose the serious thing that you need to be careful about is the assumption that the people of the past felt about things the way we do. Did they um, fall in love and grieve and fall out of love? And were they happy in the same way? way that, that we are. When you, when you consider the world of the 19th century is the world before um, Freud, the world before parliamentary democracy for most people, the world before the vote for women or trade unions or Marx has entered the sort of political discourse and so many of the things, you know, there are still slaves in, in large parts of the world. So many of the things that we take for granted and that must surely have conditioned how we feel haven't yet come into existence. People have huge families, many, many children. Do they, see, do they feel the same loss and grief when one of them dies as we would now when people have one or two children? Not to say that they don't feel any grief but, th but that you wonder it's the same. So you, again, you have to tread that line between trying to be faithful to the realities of the past and not recreating it as though you were trying to build an exhibit in a museum. So it's very hard, really. Yes, down the back. Hold on a second, let me. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, all right, um, Considering what you've said, that the difficulties of historical fiction are, I was wondering um, to you what, what the draws of writing that way are. If it's so hard, why do you do it? That's a damn good question. <laughs> I suppose there's a certain tradition of writing, particularly in Ireland, you know, in my part of the world. It's there in the work of, of Singh, who features in my book, and in the work of Yeats and Sean O'Casey, who also appear as characters. And in my tradition, generally, of writing through a kind of lens, that sometimes when you appear to be writing about A, you're actually writing about B all the time. So Star of the Sea, which came out in 2002, or, or two or three in different three. countries. Um, you know, it's a novel about a famine. Um, but if I were to boil it down to its constituent parts, I would say, well, here's a book about people who are hungry, a book about a world on the ship where, you know, the small number of people in first class have too much. And there are nightly arguments about the quality of the cooking. and A lot of their food gets thrown out and some of them feel that they're overweight and um, there's a lot of arguing about position, who gets the nicest room. 
And down in steerage, where the vast majority of the ship are, people have nothing at, nothing at all. Um, and that the people on the ship who have worked hardest in the sense of doing manual labour, just getting up early in the morning and working hard all day, have absolutely nothing, whereas the people on the ship who've never done any work in their lives have the most. Um, and it's a book about a book about that, a book about, you know, the conditions within which terrorism becomes possible, a book about sort of deciding to hate groups of people because of where they're from, and a book about hope, a book about emigrants, a book about this country very much, about what happens to the language when so many people come here. And the more I describe it to myself, the more this book set in 1847 begins to me to feel like a very familiar place indeed, you know. So I think every historical novel really is about the time in which it's written, whether even whether it wants to be or not, because a novel is made of language and language exists in the political, in the social world and it reflects our prejudices and our biases and our dreams and our aspirations and all of those things. It's why novels written now are not the same as novels written in the 19th century. It's like in the way that the great sort of Hollywood movies of ancient Rome that were made in the 1950s are really about America in the 1950s, far more than they are about ancient Rome. You know, a story is always, for it to work, it has to have a redolence of of now, you know, so for me, it's really, it's a way of writing about now. I mean, the follow up novel to Star of the Sea, this book here, Redemption Falls, which looks at what happens to the children of the ship um, about 20 years later, the American Civil War is on. And various families on the ship are touched by this in various ways. It's a huge event in Irish immigrant history. Um, so, you know, that book was written at a time when um, well, let me say Redemption Falls, it's a novel about a war, a novel about an era in American history when the president is very unpopular, you know, and again, it begins to feel like secretly a story about familiar times. So so as a star of the sea is a novel about a famine, this one is about a war. And so I do all the cheerful subjects, as you can see. <laughs> my, my wife sometimes says to me, I suppose you're going to do pestilence next, you know. <laughs> <laughs> when can you write a nice happy love story, you know, that everyone will want to buy? So here it is. Not not that it's happy all the way through, but it's a love story at least. So anyway, yes, so a historical novel needs to be about now. <laughs>